Hello, everybody. Christian from Treasure Town here. And today I'm really excited. We've got Chuck Daughtry, a longtime numismatist and researcher and the owner of coppercoins.com and the YouTube channel Copper Coins, as well as kind of a multitude of other involvements within the coin space. But we've got him here today to just talk about his journey in coins and explain a little bit about the different ways that he's involved. So thank you so much for being on tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. So we'll, maybe we can get started. I always like to pe ask people how they got involved with coins, what the starting point, um, what piqued their interest. Uh, mine probably would have been the spring of 1975. Uh, my, my father had a, a friend that they did uh, driving at the golfing driving range together and they would show up and I would sit in the car while they would go do their driving practice. And one time when my dad's friend showed up, he showed up with a penny folder and a roll of wheat pennies and handed them to me. And I, I was, I was hooked from there on. There you go. I mean, that's uh that, that was going to be something else that I, I asked was that, you know, was it, you know, something that you got into coins, then you got into cents, or maybe that's kind of what you focused on from the beginning, beginning. And maybe it sounds like uh, the beginning, but, but what's been the kind of evolution of uh, what you've been involved in over time? Well, I kind of hoarded just about everything in, in the beginning. And up until I was about 14 years old, I would collect anything that came by me that was round in metal. I mean, including tokens, car wash tokens, pretty much anything, bottle caps, you know, whatever it was, I, I would pick it up. And when I was about 15 years old, I, I got to looking around at my collection. I realized it wasn't much of a collection. It was more of a hoard. There were a lot of things that I didn't really care for that much, but had no idea why I had them or to you know, just get rid of them. So I had to specialize in something. And at that point in time, I decided that because I didn't make a lot of money and my parents didn't make a lot of money and I was kind of poor, I decided, well, I'll just do pennies. And that's kind of where my focus went. And uh, about, let's see, about a year later, I, I discovered the, the term double die. I had no idea what I was looking into, but um, I, tur I turned open a, uh, a red book and they had the 1939 double money solo nickel in there. And I thought, well, okay. So I got my little nickel folder out and I popped the 1939 nickel out and flipped it over and looked at it. And sure enough, the word money solo was very heavily doubled. Wow. And I thought, wow, this must be that, that, that thing. Wow. That's, that's worth like $20. That's, that's really cool because I got it for a nickel. And uh, from that point on, my interest in varieties kind of brought brought me out that the mint would actually create mistakes on coins and release them. And I thought that was, I thought they caught everything and, you know, all coins were perfect, but I realized that that was not the case. And uh, I ran across a coin world and ordered a book from an author named John Wexler, who had written a book, The Lincoln Cent Double Die. And I bought that book. I still got the original copy of it that I bought back then. I still have it on my desk as a reference. And uh, that's, that's what really got me looking. I, I, for some reason, even though my first double die was a nickel, I kind of figured that pennies were where all the double dies had to be. So I would stick with pennies. And that's what I did. That sounds like good intuition. Um, I, you know, from my knowledge, it seems like the, the real space to go for the varieties does seem to be the pennies. Um, what were, what were some of the first finds? You know, I, I'd imagine it's, it's a good way to get hooked on it, get, seeing that 1939 nickel in the folder, but I'd imagine, you know, you get into searching and maybe it was, actually, that's a different, another question. Was it a lot easier? Was, was there less picked out back then? And was there more, you know, varieties waiting to be found? And then, um, you know, and, and what were some of the early finds that you made? Obviously, the further back you go, the more, you know, you, the more average you would find varieties if, if you were to look for them because fewer people looked for them. Um, now the market's kind of saturated with people looking for them. So they're becoming scarcer and harder to find simply because there's more of them in people's collections. Uh, but what I, what I noticed through the years was, uh, yeah, like uh, for instance, the 1983 double die reverse penny, I've been looking for one since 1983. I still haven't found one. And, and so, you know, the, the beat goes on and so does the challenge. The challenge is a lifetime challenge. And the more, the more days I spend in my life, the more I realize there's more out there I don't know about that I have to learn. And so that's what keeps the, it keeps the fuel fired or the file fire fueled. There you go. Keeps the fire fueled at, at looking at more 
things and getting into more things and continuing to look for more things. Um, I know more now today than I did yesterday. And I hope tomorrow will be the same. Definitely. No, I mean, that's, that's one thing that I find so interesting about coins is how much there really is to be learned. You can go so specific into so many different kind of cultures, or you can stick within, you know, us and there's almost infinite uh, things to learn. Um, I think for context so that people understand, cause I'd like to come back to some, some questions about varieties, but um, can you give us an overview of, you know, it's coppercoins.com. There's also lincolncent.com and then, you know, your art website uh, for coin related art, but can you give us an overview of kind of the, the different projects that you're working on? <laughs> the gambit of my work. <laughs> what keeps me sane and insane at the same time. Um, <laughs> Coppercoins.com is a comprehensive listing of all varieties of Lincoln cents, all the double dies, all the repunch mint marks, over mint marks, all the little varieties that you can find on Lincoln cents are or will be listed on that website. And that's basically what that is. It's a reference. It's a catalog. Lincolncent.com is a sales website where I sell Lincoln cents to help fund copper coins and to help fund keeping my lights on. And then the uh, YouTube channel that I work from, Copper Coins, is where I run regular auctions and run regular sales and roll reveals, which we'll discuss in a minute. But uh, I, I do that to actually create a living because, well, my wife says I have to earn money. So <laughs> it's, it's a requirement. Um, the art website, uh, uh, it's cdoctry.com. It's D-A-U-G-H-T-R-E-Y. Uh, cdoctry.com is a uh, it, it's a gallery of portraits that I've drawn where I have made the designers of our coins the subject of the art rather than the art on the coins or rather than art in general I decided to focus on the artists themselves and so I've got portraits of 10 different designers of U.S. coins uh, for sale on that website that I drew between 2006 and 2017. And uh, I'm, I'm going to continue on that, on that quest at some point, as soon as I can get myself settled down. That's one of those things where I get myself involved in some sort of a numismatic project and I get working on it. I get working on it so much, I don't really do anything else. And I have that kind of one of those personality, I guess you could call it a disorder where I get focused and I'm hyper-focused and I don't stop until I'm done. So I hope I answered the questions because I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> no, that was definitely a, a good overview of the different ways that you're involved in the art. I think just for the viewers is something we'll probably do a follow-up video on, but it's, it's definitely uh, unbelievable. And, and uh, I'll be, I'll have edited under our photos, the different websites that, that Chuck has, uh, has created. So you'll have a good reference there as well. Um, and, and then you touched on the auctions, but I want to kind of backpedal a little bit and ask, you know, one, one question that really pops into my mind with the varieties, there's so much beyond kind of the officially attributed by the grading companies, um, th those varieties and, and the ones that are getting holdered for set registry or for collecting in that way. Um, I guess the two questions that I ask or, and there's probably a way we could do another video on this alone, but um, what, what's really the process for one of these errors to become, you know, an officially attributed one where, where the grading companies are holdering it. And I, I assume that I, I think ANAX will certify more than the PCGS and NGC. I haven't personally graded much outside of a few main errors through, through PCGS. Um, so, so actually maybe we'll start there. And then after that, I'll, I'll follow up, but what's the main process? Okay, where we start is a very basic definition so that the terms are correct. Mm. Uh, die variety is a double die repunch mint mark or a repunched date, something that was done on the die prior to it being hung for use on the, on the press. An error is something that happens at the press while they're minting coins. It can either be a chip on the die, it can be a problem with the planchet, it can be a problem with the striking press itself, but those are errors. And I don't focus on errors because I have, uh, I have a, a, an ASD thing. It's an autistic spectrum disorder where I, I can't really understand the concept of a set when you don't know what a set is. So I don't know. I, I can't collect all the different uh, years of Lincoln cents with a clip at 20% at 12 o'clock because I don't know that all of them exist. Nobody does. So 
I collect dye varieties instead, which can be cataloged by the dye that created the coin. And so if you can, if you can catalog it using markers on a dye, then I, then I'm, I write about it. I collect it. So that's a, a dye variety. Um, the process of getting one included in major mainstream publication is to submit it to one of the attributors. I would be one of the attributors. There's a number of them, John Wexler, James Wiles, uh, Koneka does their own thing now, as I understand, uh, Ken Potter. There, there's a number of different people that you could submit a letter to, submit photographs and let them know that it exists. And if it's something that they want to publish, something they want to put out there, then they'll ask you for the coin to photograph it, make reference of it, and then send the coin back to you. Next time they publish an update to their guide, the grading companies will pick up on it. And generally the grading companies don't pick up on a dye variety until it's been published. Uh, there is, for instance, a 2015D double dye reverse that was found by a person, or it's a 2015 plane. I can't remember which one, but anyhow, it was found by a collector this past year. Very strong double die reverse, really nice one. Previously completely unknown. PCGS would not put it in a holder if you sent it to them as a double die because, well, they don't have any direction saying that this is a double die. Once they get that direction officially, then it becomes a double die to them and they'll put it in a holder with that on the label. Okay, that's that's very helpful. And thanks for the clarification. Certainly, I, I um on the errors and varieties confuse the term. And that's something that I'm trying to do better with, but it's uh, definitely something important. And, and so it's good for the viewers to, to see that as well. Um, well it's, it's fortunately and unfortunately a very common thing. The reason it's unfortunate that's a very common thing is because there's a lot of misunderstanding as to exactly what is and what isn't. But it's also fortunate because it gives a teachable moment and it gives us the ability to, to explain it and make that differentiation. Definitely. Um, and, and I guess going forward, um, so, so let me even think what I was, was that, so this is how they're officially attributed. Then, um, do you think that, you know, in terms of the master list, is there like a true master list or I'd imagine that there's kind of different, um, standards as to what, because I don't think uh, a lot of the major grading companies will certify everything, or maybe they're going by the Kanika or something else. Um, um, with, with regard to the, you have to separate whether or not you're talking about the authors who create the lists or you're talking about the grading companies that will attribute them because the grading companies are working on a completely different agenda. Uh, NGC and PCGS will, will put in a holder only major dye varieties. NGC has a list on their website that you can submit to them and they'll put a, a dye variety number on it for you. PCGS generally uses cherry picker listed varieties only. Uh, Annex is much better about using published websites and published references on the web to put die numbers on things. They, if you ask them, they will use coppercoins.com to put a die number on a coin for you. They will also put any other publisher's information on there, any other author's information on there too. Um, I'm not sure exactly what ICG does these days. It used to just be the Koneka die references, but I'm not sure what they use now. Sounds good. No, that's a that's a helpful um, helpful advice. And then maybe maybe a separate question uh, related. Do you have any advice for people who are kind of starting or interested in getting involved with with cherry picking, or any any personal anecdotes that might be helpful to them, or or interesting yes. words? Uh, two things. The the first thing: always sort your coins. Don't look at them pell mell. Looking at a 1975, then a 1992, then a 1964. Your eyes can never get used to the design that you're looking at. By the time you're looking at another coin, you're looking at a slightly different design and it can confuse you as to what you're looking for. If you sort all of your coins first and you look at all 1964 pennies at one time, you'll notice doubling when you see it because it'll be different. The second thing is don't take a list of what exists and use that list to hunt. You never know when you're going to find something that no one has ever found before. So there have been new things uh, about 10, 15 years ago. I had a friend contact me via email and he said, I think I found a double die, but the funny thing is it's on the reverse of a 1982 penny. I said, really? Well, send me some pictures. Well, he did. It was one of the strongest double die reverses I'd ever seen on a memorial scent. 
and it was on a small date, Zinc, 1982, Philadelphia Lincoln Cent. Also the lowest minted of all the seven different known varieties for that year. And once we got photographs taken, got it up to Coin World and had it published, I shared the photos that I took with everyone else. Everyone else put them in their references. And suddenly we had a smack dab, beautiful, major double die to be looking for. And this guy didn't follow the rules that other people would say, well, you know, use the cherry pickers guide and just pull out what you find in there. Well, if you do that, you'll never find the good stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that's a great, you know, I, I was like in kind of shock hearing that, um, the, the 1982 double die reverse and, and, you know, that's, that's a coin that I'm familiar with. So really cool that you were kind of to be able at, to be able to be at the genesis of other people knowing about that. Um, By the way, I, I brokered the sale of that first discovery coin some eight, 10 years later for well over $8,000. Wow. No, that's, 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 that's a great, it, it's cool to be part of coin history. I, I would imagine like that. Um, not, not something I've been able to see, but, but to have it really unfolding in front of you um, and, and a good reminder to check things that that was going to be one of my last questions, kind of more specific on, on the advice is, do you look at coins that don't have the major varieties? Cause it's easy for me, you know, if I'm doing some coin roll hunting, rarely am I going through every single one because of the time commitment with doing the, you know, putting together YouTube videos, but I'll, I'll kind of look, you know, if I see an 84, I'll check for the year and 83, look at the back of the coin. Um, so, right. so, you know, it, it's a, it's a good reminder that, that there really are. And the 2015 uh, double die reverse, I don't think that I'd really been aware that that was found. So um, helpful perspective. Um, in, in terms of something else, uh, what inspired you to create the coppercoins.com? Uh, well, initially what inspired me was my cocky attitude and the fact that not all of the die information had been published to date by the two major references that were known at that time, uh, Koneka and NCADD, which they're not around anymore. It's uh, John Wexler doing this basically by himself now uh, with, with some help. But anyhow, uh, the Wexler numbers, the Wexler files and the Koneka files were two separate entities working separate from one another and for some political reason or another wouldn't even cross-reference with each other. And I found that that was, that was a bit of an issue for me because I wanted to know what a set was. When I look in a book and I see a listing for a die number 16, but I don't see die numbers 1 through 15 in there, I, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I know there are 16 different ones. And so... I contacted James Wiles of Conecuh and offered to publish photographs of every die online if he would give me the, the reference material to do it. And I was turned down. So then I contacted John Wexler for the same. And um, he, in a polite way, turned me down. Basically, he didn't want to he didn't want to deal with he was too busy. He couldn't deal with all that. And so I decided that it needed to be done anyway. So I did it myself. And so that's where Copper Coins was born. And the idea that no one could look up, just sit down at their computer and look up a double die. They couldn't do it. It wasn't possible. And so uh, I, I made it possible. That's great. No, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that's awesome. I, mean, I, I talked to some, the, the way that I came across you is that I was interested myself, but I also talked to some cherry pickers, uh, you know, people who really, really will hunt mm -hmm. in, in detail and, you know, he was like the, the first one I talked to. And then some after said, you know, copper coins is the, the way to go. Um, so I didn't realize that it was really the, the, the very start. So thank you so much for, for doing that. I, that that's great. Um, I get to learn so much on these uh, interviews as well. Um, I guess in terms of a, a question, what would you say is your, your, and maybe that is, but what's your most, the achievement you're most proud of within coins? Hmm. I would have to say through my artwork and through my authorship of information and through the photography that I've learned how to do, I have to this day, I don't know of anyone else who has been published by a major publishing house as an author, a photographer, and an artist in a numismatic book. I think I'm the only person who's ever done that. Well done. 
that's that's quite an achievement uh something to be proud of um in terms of in and and let me know if i'm if i'm missing anything else or if there's any anything that i haven't touched on but i'd also i'm interested in kind of the auctions you had mentioned that um kind of what the scope of that is um scope mainly lincoln sense mostly rolls um i go online at uh, 7 or 8 p.m. right now at 7 o'clock because of summertime. But I go on at 7 p.m. every Tuesday evening on the Copper Coins channel on YouTube and run an auction for anyone who, who is registered. Registering is free. All I have to have is your email address and your name. And uh, I go through and we run a live auction. I, I do it live broadcast. And uh, I watch the chat for bids. And just like all the other people who do the same thing, um, the difference in, in mine, I believe, is that I offer almost exclusively Lincoln Sense, and I have enough that if I stopped buying today, I'd have enough to sell for about the next 10 years. <laughs> so wow. I've got plenty of inventory to go through. And I have a lot of things that are really old that have just come up in collections. I've got original wrap rolls. I've, I don't look for the dye varieties in, in the stuff that I sell. Mm -hmm. What I what I sell is is roles that have not been searched or that to my knowledge have not been searched so that the people who purchase them from me can search them. And then when you search them and you find a variety, you can let me know you have it and possibly get your name up in the marquee lights as having discovered something. Oh, that's and awesome. That, that that's I get my my uh juices flowing out of watching other people enjoy the coins. I did it for so many years. I'm really kind of tired of doing that part of it. I just, I enjoy watching you look through a roll and, and get something out of it. That's great to hear. Oh. Um, I also do what's called roll reveals. My roll reveals, um, basically I'll take a roll, uh, an uncirculated roll of coins mm -hmm. and I will sell all 50 coins in the roll prior to opening the roll. Once I open the roll, we all discover together live under a microscope exactly what each coin is and if there's double dies repunchment marks i attribute them tell you what they are i will change your holder to uh, to show that die variety number and if yours is nicer than the one that i have on copper coins i photograph it put it on the website credit it to you and you get the plate coin the actual coin that was photographed for the website oh that's awesome that's a really cool, that's a great idea. And I'd, I'd imagine people, you know, it, it meets positive reception, fun to be kind of at the nexus of that sort of thing. Yeah. When, when I'm selling the rolls, uh, they generally sell out in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, no, that, uh, that's, that, that's when, you know, you have a, a quite a good product. Yeah. Um, it, it really kind of, it, it kind of hit me by happen chance. You know, what would happen if I opened a roll on camera and then I thought about it, well, what happens if I sell the coins prior to opening the roll on camera? And it just kind of, it, it birthed itself out of necessity because no one else was doing anything like that. You had all these people opening half dollar rolls and opening quarter rolls, but they don't give you the coins. You, you don't get the coins. They'll open the rolls for you. And if they find silver in it, they'll give you a silver dime or something. I saw that as kind of uh, not the right process to go by. I think if I'm, if I'm going to find something good in a roll, it's yours. It belongs to you before I open the roll. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a really, you know, I, uh, I've, I haven't done the auction style videos where it's, it's kind of the, what you're describing or, or really, you know, the way you've done it, but certainly how other people have done it. It, it hasn't been, you know, that it wasn't as much for me. And I think that it sounds like a really fun thing to do. Plus it's like, you're talking to the guy who's put together the, the first Lincoln sent, um, you know, database so so it's it's like a, a layer of added expertise as opposed to you know anybody can right. go through a silver find silver half dollars it's a I lot kind of a unique thing. thing doing a roll hunt with a guy who wrote the book yeah yeah exactly exactly it's like a you know maybe a, a tennis lesson from the guy who won the u.s open or something like that something like that yeah yeah so no that's that's very cool and uh you know i've tuned in briefly to some of the auctions um though you know like i said haven't um you know, made a big presence, but I think I'll, I'll stick around to hopefully get some education and maybe put, put a bid in if I can beat the 10 second, uh, that sells out. In. Well, and, and that's another thing with, with what I do and how I do it. I, I like to talk about coins. My wife can tell you that. <laughs> and when I'm talking about coins, generally I'm just blurting something out that seems rather innocuous and obvious to me. 
but it sure teaches a lot of other people because evidently this little nut up here has got more in it than most people do about Lincoln Sense. And when I spit something out, you know, like 1973 is a one year reverse type. It has really big initials. Really? I didn't <laughs> you know, know that. A lot of people just don't know that. I and didn't. It, it's just, you know, it's just one of another number of things that I've learned through the years. And I just automatically look for this kind of stuff. I just automatically do it this way. Well, nobody knows that way unless I put it out there. And in, in teaching people how I do what I do, it makes it more of an open world for them to learn something new from that to use for themselves. Like when I'm looking through coins under a microscope, I don't do it one coin at a time. I've got these other things. Oh, wow. I put 25 pennies on this board, slide it under the microscope, and I've got another one just like it. So I put the top one over the bottom one, flip it over, and I've flipped every coin over right there. And I can look through the other side. I can look through a whole roll of coins inside of two or three minutes. Wow. No, that's that's the way to do it. I, I, uh, I'm getting some new ideas for when I when I go downstairs. You know, that sounds like actually a good way to do it instead of picking up. And like you were saying, you know, first sorting it out. But then when you have kind of the industrial 25 roll, you know, it's that's right. figured out like a master. <laughs> exactly. It's like shooting, hunting in your backyard with a machine gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's that's some good ingenuity. I mean, one other thing I was going to ask is what people, what you'd want people to gain from the work that you've done. Maybe that touched on it, but if there's anything else, um, I want everyone to become their own expert. I don't believe that anyone is really all that much, let's say, smarter than anyone else about this. It's a matter of exposure to the material. When you have exposure to the material, like I do, I've done over 40 years of it pretty much every day of my life. And so you can understand that through that period of time, I've learned a lot. And it's not that I'm smarter than anybody else. It's just that I continuously expose myself to it until I learn it. And once I've learned it, I know it hard, just like that. And the stuff that I know can become much more easily absorbed by the next person if I leave that information behind for them in some viewable format. That's not something I had when I was a kid. You had some of the people writing a book here and there, but they were very far removed. There was no internet. You know, you couldn't just call them on the telephone. You never saw videos of them. And so we have so much with technology now that allows us just to parse this information, throw it out there so that anyone and everyone can grab it and use it. it it's highly valuable. And for people who do know their stuff and are not using some media format to get it out there shame on them because this is i mean this is a great hobby and this, this is what i want to do this is how i want to do it i want to leave a legacy of information that other people can use long after i'm gone to learn from it and do what i did and then carry it forward carry it farther and, totally. and learn more about it and give the next person even more than i could no, I think, I think that's a great way to be operating and maybe similar to how I view, you know, I, I've enjoyed basically that my channel is just watching people watching me learn about coins and then tell it to them. So, you know, having less of an experienced perspective, that's like coming along for the ride. And I think, you know, people have told me and I'm sure it's been, well, I, I know from other people's emails that, that it's been the same case for, for you, but that, that people are getting into collecting through these sites and learning and, and, you know, with the YouTube, it actually puts the, the, you know, the algorithm puts coins in front of people who would have never otherwise seen it. So right. that's, that's exactly. awesome that you've been, been doing that. And that's, I, I, I mean, I hope to continue doing that through the years. And of course there's something to gain for me in it, in, revenue from ads and more channel watchers and things like that. Any, you know, more subscribers that we get, the better off we are. And all it, all it takes is to tap that like button and we go into the algorithm of more search result and more people see us. The more people see us, the better money we can make on the monetization that comes back from it. And we can actually make a living teaching people without them having to pay for it. Totally. No, it's, it's what a uh, wonderful place. This world is it's, it's great. No, exactly. And it, it, uh, certainly, you know, that's something for me. It's like the, you know, at this point I, I'm not planning on doing coins right out of college, but if it grows to the point where I could, or, you know, this, this helps me, you know, I'm still working a, a job by, by the hour, but this can help me to, 
you know, pay for the equipment to make the, the videos or pay for the coins that I have to go, go and get. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful how that all comes together. So I'm always thankful to the viewers for subscribing and liking and, and, uh, you know, helping that effort. I, I went through a decade in the air force. And then after the air force, I went into uh, doing computer business for other people and working for other people. And it wasn't until just a few years ago, I decided to branch out and just do this on my own and just make it my own thing. And uh, it, it all through those years, it paid me just a little bit to keep me going in the hobby or paid for my equipment or paid for another book or something like that. But then over the years, it's allowed me to put it into a, a, a perspective where now I can actually make a living at it. Definitely. And it is what I do for a living. That's all that that's a uh, that's great to hear. And um, I know I know one of the things that we touched on um, and, you know, hopefully we can film more videos beyond this, but was the the art. And I didn't want to leave that totally. You know, I, I know you were said you it focuses on the the engraver. And if you go check out mm -hmm. cdaughtry.com, you'll definitely yeah. see the, the examples. But um, can you just give me a little bit of information about how you started that and how it's kind of evolved over the years? Well, I wanted to write a book about Lincoln Sense. And I wanted a picture of the designer of the Lincoln Sense. And I couldn't find one that I really liked that I wanted to use. So I decided to draw him instead. So I drew a photo, of, uh, drew an image of, of Victor David Brenner with the Lincoln bust down on, in front of his shoulder and his name across the bottom in the, in the same font that they use on the back of the scent. And I decided, well, you know, this looks kind of neat. Um, I'll, I'll show it off because, you know, I like the accolades of having done a good job and people pat me on the back. It's just a normal thing. I showed it off in this, uh, in a PCGS forum actually is where it was. And people there asked me, uh, are you making prints of this? How much, how much can I get a print for? And I thought, well, I never really thought about it that way, but I ended up going to Kinko's and we worked out a way of making good 11 by 14 prints of that drawing. And I, I made them available, signed, autographed, you know, a portrait of Victor David Brenner, and they sold out. And I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is kind of neat. So then I put a, a, a list of designers up on uh, a poll, and I went by the list as to the order that they were asked for. So Augustus St. Gaudens was next, and then uh, James Barton Longacre was third. And then in uh, December of 2006, I was at the uh, Baltimore show and I had been working on my Longacre drawing and I took it to the show to show it to Rick Snow, who was going to uh, have it included in his Whitman uh, book on Indian head sense. And I was headed back to my table. I was doing photography there. I was headed back to my table and I got a tap on the shoulder and I turned around. It was Dave Bowers and I said, yes, sir. And he says, you're the guy who does portraits of people, right? And I said, uh, yes, sir. He says, I'm about to do a, a, a book on quarters and I'd like for you to do Flanagan for me. <laughs> I said, okay, I can do that. He says, I'll have my people over at the Smithsonian send you some photographs of him. <laughs> I said, okay. And that's exactly what happened. My fourth drawing was John Flanagan because uh, Dave Bowers wanted it for the, for the Whitman Red Book on quarters. And that's, that's how that got started and how it got going. Then after that, I just kind of continued following the list and putting more of them out. Um, and I, you know, some personal issues and jobs and things like that came along and things kind of slowed down a bit. And I did the last three that I did over the last, uh, I guess the last five years. And then I just kind of stopped doing those. My next series, should I be able to get back into it and do those? Uh, it, it's going to be the mints, all the different mints. Um, mm. the original mint buildings, um, starting with Dahlonega. I have a fascination with the Dahlonega mint in Georgia. And, uh, it's, uh, one of the few mints that no longer exists because of a fire in 1872. But, uh, I know what the original building looked like and it's my intent to do a really good architectural style drawing of it and then do watercolor dab paintings of toned coins from the Dahlonega mint behind it. 
Oh, wow. No, that, that, that sounds spectacular. And uh, I always have been, I haven't really read too much of the history on the Dahlonega mint, but uh, I've seen, you know, I've gotten a few of the original D mint mark uh, coins and, and they're, you know, that sounds like something to be excited about when that, when that reveals. And I, yeah, I was impressed by the art. I was, I'm, uh, I'll have to, you know, contact you after, after this, uh, you know, after we stop recording about some of those art pieces, because I've got some open space back there, but I'd encourage the awesome. viewers to do this, the same and, and, uh, and go to cdaughtry.com. Um, is there anything else, you know, I always try to keep the interviews, maybe, you know, not, you know, we can always do more specific videos, but is there anything else that you think I've kind of missed out on or that you'd really want to tell people before we uh, say that this video is over? I don't think so. I mean, I think we've covered a good general gambit of things just to kind of sort of learn who I am and what I do. Um, and it, it's been a, it, it's been an adventure in itself trying to remember everything and come up with all the, all the anecdotes of information that are, that can constitute my life in numismatics. It's, it's something that if you had told me 40 years ago, this was going to happen to me, I would have told you you were joking. It's like I, my first coin book was a 1969 red book from a garage sale that my aunt had picked up for me. And I started, I looked through that book as my first coin book. And when I saw the name Kim Brissett on the cover of the, of the newer red books, I thought, wow, this guy's got to know pretty much everything. And Kim Brissett has since actually become a friend of mine. I've been inside of his house. And you couldn't have told me that I would ever go to Kim Brissett's house and meet his wife and have, have tea with them. You know, it's, it's just, it was amazing. No, that's, that's wonderful to hear. And that, that, that's a good memory. I, this is the, my very first coin book. And then I think I met Ken at a, at a and a and a, I'm still technically a, a YN, a young numismatist. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm 20 years old. So maybe, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a program later this summer that's for 13 to 21. I think maybe the ANA considers it 18. That was two years ago when I went out. But um, it's, it's, it's kind of a Colorado. Yes, I did. I went to Colorado. It was a really nice, uh, that opened my eyes. And I got to see a lot of the people that I've been, you know, whether it was this one or some others um, that, that I've been reading at their articles and books. So, so, uh, that was a really, that, it was generous of the, the ANA the, the, or the, the PNG. I always want to give, um, you know, thanks to the PNG. They sponsored me to right. go out there. So right. um, that was kind of them. And, I, and the I spent uh, three years out there teaching digital photography and Lincoln Sense. And I got to rub shoulders with, you know, some of the guys that have been doing it for many years, like JP Martin and some, some of the other guys that had just been doing it forever, Rick Snow. Uh, James Wiles, Fred Weinberg, you know, a bunch of the people have been there and it, it, it was just an absolute blast. It's one of the only places that you're ever going to have the time to be able to just sit and talk with someone who's been in coins for years and gain information from them just by sitting and drinking a Coke at the moonlight at night. It's just, it's really, it's really fun. Definitely. No, it's, it's, uh, and, and that's kind of what I try to bring, you know, hope other people can ha have uh, a seat at the table when we're doing this video and, um, you know, get to know some of the people that's really been my goal behind a lot of the, the coin resources. So I really appreciate you coming on today and, and being a part of the video. And I hope to do some more videos with you in the future. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching the video. I encourage you to like comment and definitely subscribe to the channel and connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I also have a website, treasuretownyt.com, where you should go so that you can learn more about coins as well as what's happening on the channel and possibly find a place to sell your coins and collectibles. I also want to talk about some of my other projects like coinmeltprice.com, which shows precious metals prices as well as the melt values of coins containing those precious metals, both US and world. I also have coinsmetalscards.com, which will develop into a full marketplace, as well as a news source for coins, metals, cards, as the name might suggest. And then treasuretowncoins.com, which long term will be my coin dealing entity separate from the channel. And lastly, whatsthegrade.com, which will be a stickering service for already certified collectibles where you can get a approval or verification of the grade on the holder. Hope you have a wonderful day, and I look forward to seeing you on some of my other videos.